Joshua chapter 5. It came to pass that all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, were on the other side of the Jordan River now. We are in the land of Canaan. We are in that land that God has promised to the Jews. We are in a land of enemies. We're in heavy populated and walled cities. And the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel. There was no radio TV back then. There was no vans. There was no media, no news organizations, but the word got out. Israel, the God of Israel. We need to be afraid of them. We need to worry about them. Look at chapter 2, verse 10. Joshua 2.10. And let's... For we have heard how the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Back at, stay there in, in Joshua 2, but it says over here in 5.1. We have heard that the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The word's getting out. There is a mighty God. And that mighty God is the God of Israel. And if your God that you're relying on today is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you've got the wrong God. So Rahab 2.10 But we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. So see they found out about that again. That word stretched out. Here comes a group of people Balak wants to hire Balaam because here comes his strong people and we can't beat them because of their God. Because of their Lord Jehovah. Dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. So the testimony is there. And what ye did unto the two kings and Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And all the kings of the Canaanites that were on, the, on by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel. And there are wonderful, mighty acts that are in a Christian life. And they ring out to others. Our life as a Christian to others, look at that controversy, look at that raging waters that guy is going through, and yet, look what his God has done for him. Look at this big body of water, man, this travesty, this, this thing in their life, man, how are they going to get through it? And yet the Lord pro provides a dry land. And the media gets around like I'm the kind of person I will read the headlines if it's interesting I'll open up I'm not newsless and yet I don't put my time into news I look at the headlines I may miss a lot but I don't miss a lot through the Bible I get the, the big stories and what we see here is by Jericho with Rahab telling us and what we see with the kings of the children in the Canaanite land God's a mighty God and when the world looks at that they fear he said well why is there no fear today of God because the church has taken on the world and acted and be as the world the church gets involved with psychiatry. It gets involved in public schools. It gets involved in I got to get a gun and never relies on God to do anything. Look at Revelation chapter 3. There he goes. He's going to read about making God sick. No, I'm not going to read that part. Look, look at the attitude to church here. The attitude to church 3. Verse 17, because thou sayest, I'm rich. Look how great I am. 
Increase with goods. Look at look at look at all the seats. Look at the auditorium. Look at the basketball court. Look at the big movie screen. Look at the bouncing Himmel dot. They have need of nothing. They don't need God. And know it's not thou wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What's Israel doing here? Reliance on God. They couldn't control that water. And when God said cross, they crossed. When God said take 12 stones out, they took 12 stones out. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now look, here we go again. Circumcision. Again. It shows up. In Genesis 17 to Abraham, if anybody of your seed that's, that is born of you, that is born in your house, circumcised. Paul speaks about a spiritual circumcision. He speaks about that circumcision of the flesh that, hey, you may be circumcised, but in the church age, that's not going to save your soul. You got to be spiritually circumcised by the, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Joshua made sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of foreskins. How many males were there? It made a hill of foreskins. And in Genesis 17, when God told Abraham, it said, not only your children, but those that are bought, the males of your household. And when Joshua lines up the males for the children of Israel, it makes a hill. And there's one other spot in the Bible where you find out, you know, such a mass of foreskin. I mean, what a subject we're talking about today. That the fact is that when King Saul th sought to kill David, and he found out that Micah, his, Michael, his daughter, loved David, he said, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll use this to kill David. And David, to have my daughter, I want you to go get a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. That's going to kill David. A hundred versus one. David's gone. David's dead. I don't need to worry about. David comes back with 200 and counts them out in front of the king and gets Michael. When was the last time you got a message about what we're reading about right now? But here it is. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males. And of the men of war, males and men of, men of war. There is never a circumcision mentioned in the Bible of women or females or girls. That is a false, perverted religion that will do any kind of this surgery to females. In the Bible, Genesis 17, what we're reading now is males getting circumcised. The men of war died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. Now, all the people that came out were circumcised. Everybody that came out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, circumcised, the males. So they kept that in Egypt. They obeyed God as far as the circumcision of Genesis 17 of the Abraham covenant and, and being rigor service to the Egyptians. The eighth day, or thereabouts, the boys were circumcised. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, to all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, died, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom did the Lord swear that he would not show them the land, which the Lord swore unto their fathers, that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, what's the reason why that Joshua had to circumcise them again? When Moses sent the twelve men into the land to spy out the land, they came back with those large mountain clusters of grape and they reported that oh we're just like grasshoppers there are walls up to heaven there are giants we can't do it 
And God says, for 40 days, you sent those spies for 40 years, you're going to walk in the wilderness. And during that 40 years of that wilderness travel, just going around these circles that everyone died, no one circumcised their children. Rebelling against God. And now we are in the land of Cana. We are in the promised land to the Jewish people. And the first thing we're going to do is that we cross that river. You got to get back to Abraham. I told Abraham to circumcise the males of their children. You're not circumcised. Now we can run back to Matthew chapter 3 again. see something interesting here not the wording of the Bible scripture with scripture study Matthew 3 verse 9 and think not to say within yourself we have Abraham to our father well what was the commandment in Genesis 17 to Abraham circumcision we're talking to Jewish people, Israelite people, who are of the circumcised. That was their mark of Abraham. And here we're in a point where Joshua, the men, the boys, the males, have not been part of this sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And it's got to be done. And the rebellion of these parents in that 40 years has caused great pain, physical pain, to their children. For the Bible says, and it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. There is no... modern medicine here there is no pain relief medicine there is no anesthesia and when God has set forth Genesis 17 he set rules and he set rules for a reason I don't care what doctors do today doctors are wrong God is right And the fact is that our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, born of Mary, the eighth day he was circumcised. Jewish. Uh, what did I say? Genesis 17, verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, Abraham, and thy seed after thee in their generations from the everlasting covenant. To be God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee to thy seed after thee the land. That's where we are in Joshua. They're in the land. Where that wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee, in their generations. There was 40 years in the wilderness they were not doing what God told them to do. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every male child, every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. He that is eight days old shall be circumcised among every man child no female in your generation he that is born in the house or bought with money or any stranger which is not of thy seed he that is born in thy house he that is bought with thy money must must needs to be circumcised well, we got 40 years here with Joshua and it has not happened. And you cannot go any further in the land that God has promised them. Look at, this is far from the gospel to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ thou shalt be saved. You're in the land, but you're not right. How do we get right in the law under Joshua? You got to be circumcised. And that wasn't even the law. 
There was no law with Abraham. That came around Exodus 20 and afterwards. So be right with God where there is no gospel yet. Christ has not died. He has not been buried. He has not risen from the dead where we are now in Joshua chapter 5. If you want to be right with God and you want to be as the children of Abraham, whether you're born of Abraham, whether you're bought by Abraham, see, you're to be circumcised and that has not happened. They are not the children of Abraham right now, and they're not right with God. And when we saw that promise, Genesis 17, the land grant was mentioned with the circumcision. They can do whatever they want right now, but they're not right with God. In order to get right with God, now they got to have the spiritual, I mean, excuse me, not, I don't mean spiritual, I'm wrong. They got to have the circumcision, physical, foreskin, piece of flesh. Then they can be back to the children of Abraham. And when you run back to Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, and Mo, uh, John the Baptist says, if you think you're the children of Abraham, at that point in time we're in Joshua, in that point in time that we are where John the Baptist, you have to have a physical operation on your body as a male to show that you are of the covenant of Abraham, the sign, the token. Now it said eight days year eight days year old, eight days old, not years. God has designed by the Creator before even he settled this down with Abraham that eight days. When a male child is eight days old, he is physically right of his blood and the chemistry of that body outside of evolution in the big bang that eight days is the most proper day and time to do that circumcision where there is hardly any pain to be felt by that baby and joshua's got men probably eight days just born one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, seven year, eight year, nine, and go on. And you don't put a mask over them and put them on a gurney and wheel them into the operating room and, you know, to take a deep breath as the surgeries I've had. Take one good deep breath and then you wake up in your recovery and then they pop you with pills and IVs and you just feel, you know, whoa. No, this would be a very painful surgery. And this would have been in the Civil War of, of America that you would hand a guy a bottle of whiskey. You're going you're gonna to amputate his arm or his leg and here is some whiskey. You get him drunk. So he can't feel nothing. He says, Stolly, would you ever, ever have a reason to drink? If they were going to perform an oper operation on me, amputation, there's no anesthesia. <laughs> I'd rather have a bottle of something that's going to knock me out and put me in wild, wild land. Rather, there were places where they just put a stick in your mouth. But here we are in Joshua. Here we are in 1451 BC, and it's going to hurt <laughs> what they did. Now, it could have been done when they were eight, to eight days old, but let's rebel against God and not do what God tells us. And parents need to realize that if you're going to rebel against God, it's going to hurt your children. Look at the present state of America. When you're taking God out of the schools, you're taking the Bible out of the schools, you're taking Jesus Christ out of the school, and you got death. The wages of sin is death. Thank evolution and thank don't spank the little children. Just do whatever they want. Darwin, Spock, and all them. And you're not going to put the Bible back in school. So there will be, there will be, there will be no restor restoration of the public school system. You know how there's restitution here in the book of Joshua? We're supposed to circumcise. God says circumcise. Let's do it. It's going to hurt. But that's what God wanted. 
It's going to hurt many people. You're going to put the Bible and Jesus back in the school, and you're going to, oh, I'm offended. I don't want. <laughs> Those who won't, I guarantee there are probably people here who didn't do this. Well, I'm not going to have that pain, and you weren't right with God. It's funny what the Bible talks about. I mean, what do we know about the birth of Jesus Christ that morning or afternoon? Nothing. But, man, when you get into circumcision in the Bible, wow, there's a lot. What a weird subject. Let's move on. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. All right? Do not. Israel, do not associate yourself anymore with Egypt. You are in your land. That's Egypt's land. God's forever going to tell them, don't go back, and they, they will go back. You are not under the gods of the Egyptians anymore. You're not under the bondage and slavery of the Egyptians anymore. You are, the Egyptians didn't have circumcision. You do. You are not under the Egyptian cause anymore. You are in your land again. You are not in their land. I have re-rolled off you the Egyptian thing. Don't take their gods. Don't take their dress. Don't take them. You are children of God. You are children of Abraham. The circumcision. All that is gone. Isn't it great when the Lord Jesus Christ took the reproach of the world and sin off you and washed you? And made you clean. And when Satan comes back and says, You remember that thing, Solomon, when you were 10 years old? You did that. I say, Listen, I was saved when I was 18. So, what I did when I was 10, April 21st, 1987, when I received Christ as my Savior, even though Satan and my flesh will bring that up, that's under the blood. There's no more reproach. It's gone. Rolled away at the empty tomb. It's under the blood. You are now Jewish people. You are now the children of Abraham. You are not Egyptian. You are in your land. Isn't that great? <clears throat> Excuse me. How are you? Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. <coughs> Excuse me. Rolling. Means rolling. As I said last night. Go and look under the videos about Gilgal. And in archaeology, it's amazing. It's wonderful. Dr. Adam Zurich, Z-E-R-T. Am I terrible writing? That's either A-L or A-H. I write terrible. You don't want to see my terrible writing. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. Here we got a date. Abed, 14th. 40th year coming out of Egypt, we have kept the Passover. We've got Joshua, Jehovah saved. We got Jesus, Jehovah saved. What is this mark here? Well, approximately. Uh, I, I have trouble with the BC and all that. Approximately 1451 years and another 30 years. So, I'm going to say approximately 1,500 years. I'm off by that, but let's say 1,500 years from this date of Joshua. Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves Jesus. Is going to climb Mount Calvary. Being beaten. Being spitted upon with a crown of thorns. To be nailed on the cross at even. He will die as the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. How's that? So in Joshua, we're looking at Jesus. And we've got a date. And I don't think the resurrection of Jesus Christ would have been on April Fool's. And if you're a, if you're a person saying, well, happy resurrection day on April 1st, <laughs> you're a fool. Our calendar is Roman Catholic, friend. It ain't Jewish. Jewish people go by the moon, not the Baal. Almighty Baal, sunrise service. Almighty Baal. 
Oh, we worship that sun, S-O-N. Yeah, change it whatever you want. They even changed the name of that star. E-A-S-T-E-R. So you can worship the gods, just give them new names. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow, after the Passover. Unleavened cakes, parched corn, and self same day. Abit 15, the feast of unleavened bread, 40 years after coming out of Egypt. We've got the Passover. We've got the feast of unleavened bread. They are in the land. Christ, our Passover lamb. Christ, the lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And the man of cease on the morrow, after they have eaten the old corn in the land, of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Cana that year. So during the feast of unleavened bread, you went out in the morning, there was no more manna. It was gone. It was done. You know what happened when Jesus Christ suffered and died on that cross? And three days and three nights later, he came out of that tomb. That tomb was empty. He's not here. He is risen. You know what happened? We put our faith and trust in the bread of God, Jesus Christ. And it's not to be eaten bread. You don't eat Jesus. Jehovah saves. And that afternoon he went from Calvary to the empty tomb. And now the children of Israel, they're eating the wheat, they're eating the barley, they're eating all the crops of the land, the old food right now of the olives, the grapes, the raisins. They are now in their homeland, eating from their homeland, and there is no more manna to be provided. Now you've got to provide for your own to the nation of Israel in their promised land. Now they got to become like Adam. They're going to become dressers of the gardens. Isn't that interesting? So the man of seas. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, or between Gilgal and Jericho. And he lifted up his eyes and looked. Look and live, my brother, look and live. And behold, there stood a man, a man, over against him, he was near him, with a sword drawn in his hand. So, here's this man, shows up. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us, Jews, or for our adversaries? He said, Nay. But a captain of the host of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Am I now come? Now here we go. Here we go. Here's the identity of that man. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. Cornelius falls down before Peter. Peter says, get up, man. Don't you fall down before me. The first pope said, no, no worship me, worship God. John, two or three times in the book of Revelation, fell down before an angel, fell down before a man to work. No, 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 get up, I'm one of you. Don't you worship me. Nowhere in the Bible when angels show up, right angels of God, do they accept the worship and offer of the people. Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord, my God. And Jesus did not rebuke him. Who is this captain of the host? Who is this captain of God? Who is this man that has a sword? Well, who's coming back for Israel in the defense of Israel with a sword out of his mouth is going to cross the Jordan where Joshua just crossed, where Joshua and Jesus both mean Jehovah saves. That's Jesus Christ. There he is. Joshua is standing right by Jesus and Jesus is standing with Joshua and they both have the same name and title. Jehovah saves.
He fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said unto him, What saith my Lord? Now that's a small L because he doesn't know who he's dealing with. He doesn't know it's God, Jesus Christ. Unto his servant. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe. Take off your shoe. From off thy foot. For the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Take off your shoes. Right there is holy. Now we got another event like that in Exodus 3 5. Exodus 3 5. And more oil will start in verse number 2. And the angel of the Lord, angel of the Lord, appeared unto him, Moses, in a flame of fire, out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Well, that's a miracle. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt? It's burning, but it's not burnt. Should have consumed itself by now. And when the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, saw that, he turned aside to see. God called up that Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah. Run that to verse 2. That's the angel of the Lord. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ shows up to Joshua. Jesus Christ shows up to Moses. In verse 5, he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. Jesus, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, tells Moses and tells Joshua, Moses the lawgiver, Joshua the one that brings him into the promised land, remove your shoes. For this is holy ground. Now Moses is in a Mount Sinai where later on in Exodus 20 he's going to get the law. And when on Mount Sinai where the law is, God says that's holy ground. And Joshua over here in between Gilgal and Jericho he says it's holy. It doesn't say ground. That place where you are is holy. Now why is that? Maybe that's where Jesus is going to put his feet when he crosses over Jordan. Never mind holy water, you got holy dirt. Holy mountain, holy place. This is in Joshua, this is not where Moses is. And in Exodus, that's not where Joshua is. Moses never entered the promised land. Joshua did not go back to Mount Sinai. We've got the giver of the law. Take off your shoes. You're in a holy, holy ground. You got the one that brings the children over the Jordan River into the land. And he says, take off your shoes. The place where you are is holy. Now we got another thing about shoes. Ephesians 6.15 Ephesians 6.15 This gets better And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace Moses and Joshua were told remove your shoes Paul writes the Ephesians says, put shoes on. God says, here, here's some shoes. What are they? It's the gospel. Moses and Joshua did not have no gospel to give to the people. They had the law. Christians going all the world, go, put your shoes on, and preach the gospel. You put it on your shoes.
You want one more place to go? You want to go further? Interesting. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And we'll start in verse 13. Romans 10, 13. We're looking at taking off your shoes, putting on your shoes. To the Jewish person, that land of Palestine, that land of Canaan, that's their heaven. That's their, all things are all things. And people say the church age is under the law and, and there's no difference. Why are we putting our shoes on? Why are our shoes the gospel? When Moses and Joshua, the two leading men of the children of Israel, take off your shoes. There is no holy ground for a Christian. There is no holy place for a Christian except for New Jerusalem. We're not told pray east, north, west, south, whatever. We're told to pray to God through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Now Romans chapter 10 verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, <coughs> sorry, shall be saved. Amen. Glory to God. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? I don't know. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard I don't know and how shall they hear without a preacher going all the world preach the gospel how shall they preach except they be sent go as is written how beautiful are the feet of them feet feet Ephesians feet what do you put on feet shoes that preach the gospel of peace. There's Ephesians. And bring glad tidings of good things. Look at that. We're told to put shoes on. What are the shoes, Ephesians 6.15? It's the gospel. That's remarkable. Let's take our Bible to Isaiah 52.7. Go further. Isaiah 52 7 paragraph Isaiah 52 7 how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him him that bringeth good tidings and publishes peace and bringeth good tidings of good that publish salvation that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Over here it says, Gospel. In Isaiah, there is no gospel because Jesus had not died according to scriptures. He was not buried. And he arose, had not risen from the grave according to scripture. But when we go open the Romans and when we open up Ephesians, Christ has died according to scripture. He's buried. And he arose from the grave. He is not here. He is risen according to the scriptures. Now we have the gospel. That's not in the Old Testament. The Old Testament. Take off your shoes. We got holy ground. We got holy dirt. We got holy this, holy that. Church age. Put your shoes on. We got the gospel. The holiness that we have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Nahum 1. Nahum Chapter 1, verse 15. Nahum 115. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. See, we can't say gospel. Because there is no gospel yet. Good tidings means gospel. Gospel means good news. The law wasn't good. The law was to show that I was a sinner. When I came to Christ, the, thou shalt not steal. I've done that. Well, you're condemned. Oh. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Oh, I've lied. Oh. Thou shalt not look upon a man to lust after a woman in his heart. He therefore he committed adultery. 528 Matthew. Oh, I've done that. Thou shalt put God first. Oh, I've done that. I shall have no idols. Ooh, don't, oh, man, the laws keep showing me I'm condemned. That's not good. 
When I look at the law, I see I'm condemned. I'm a sinner. That's not good because the wages of sin is death. So what is the good news? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gospel. That's what go in all the world and preach the gospel that Jesus saves. The law condemns, but Jesus saves. Old Judah, keep the, thy solemn feast. That's not me. Perform thy vows. That's not me. And that's where we stand. In Christ. Where do they stand when we're studying in Joshua? They stand on the law. What, what, what is the man in the law? Well, tell me where he's going. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's all about it. You don't know. Where are they standing? Where are they going? These things have I written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. That's New Testament. That's church days. That's John writing. You don't find anything like that in, your, in the Old Testament. And you read, well, if you don't do this, he shall be cut off. That means you're going to hell. There were no sacrifices for murder. There was no sacrifices for adultery. There was no sacrifices for false uh, God worship. And other things. What about the church age? These things, uh, let's go to 1 John 1 7. Let's quote that rightly. 1 John 1 7. What about the church age? 1 9, excuse me. What about the church age? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the good news of the shoes of the Christian. So in the law, remove your shoes. In the nation of Israel with the land, remove your shoes, Moses. Moses is on the mountain of the law. Soon will be happening. Joshua is in the promised land. Take off your shoes. Christ has died. He's been buried. He rose from the grave. Put your shoes on. We have no more earthly tabernacle. We have no more worldly place. This world is not my home. Get out there as an evangelist. Get out there as a pilgrim. Take those shoes and deliver the gospel. Go in all the world and preach the gospel. And one day... Whether it be absent from the body, present with the Lord, or come up hither, then we'll get our home. Too many Christians have settled in the world, and we this, this is not our settling place. You want to settle in the world, you put yourself where Israel is. That's where they settled, in the land. And even then they didn't do it right. 